This is At Home with ADTS, a show that presents topics of interest to older adults, individuals with disabilities, and their caregivers. At Home highlights the services and programs offered by Aging, Disability, and Transit Services of Rockingham County. Hello and welcome to this edition of At Home with ADTS, a program about supports and services offered by Aging, Disability and Transit Services of Rockingham County. I'm Ashley Cooper, Director of Community Outreach and Development here at ADTS. ADTS has been in operation in Rockingham County since 1973. Our goal has always been to assist and link senior adults, people with disabilities and their caregivers with information, opportunities and services that promote and enhance the quality of life, as well as working to meet the local transportation needs of Rockingham County residents. We would like to give a special thank you to the United Way of Rockingham County for their longtime generous support for our Meals on Wheels program. United Way of Rockingham County brings together local people to help raise local dollars to meet local needs. And we thank everyone who's contributed. Today, our guest is Natalie Leary with the Duke Dementia Family Support Program. Hi, Natalie. Hi. Hi, Ashley. Thanks so much for the opportunity to be here today. Absolutely. Do you mind introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about the Duke Dementia Family Support Program? Happy to. Um, so as you mentioned, my name is Natalie Leary, and I'm one of the social workers at the Duke Dementia Family Support Program. We are a small team. Uh, we're four social workers, and uh, we have the privilege of working with folks regardless of their affiliation to Duke. I often tell folks, it doesn't matter what you think about our basketball team, we can still work with you. Um, so we work with a lot of families across North Carolina that are either noticing some changes in their family members, some changes in the way that they think about things and they remember things, or there's already a pre-existing diagnosis and there might be questions around what's our next step? Where do we go from here? Or this is a challenging behavioral symptom that we're seeing and we're not sure how to respond to that. So our team is able to work with folks, answer their questions, provide over the phone consultation. Um, and so that's a little bit about what we do. Wonderful, that's exciting. Um, I know you've worked in Rockingham County for some time, so we're excited to have you here with us. Um, can you, today we're gonna to talk about caregiving and like the different caregiving roles that happen, um, not only as a spouse, but maybe as an adult child, um, and then also as a long distance caregiver. So before we get started with that, um, how would you define what caregiving means or um, who is a caregiver? Oh, that's a good question. So I think about I think about the term caregiver, and then I automatically also think about the term care partner, um, which you may sometimes hear people use. And I think so. To me, there is a there is a difference, and I think it depends on how folks might identify in their current situation. But when I think about the the term care partner. I think uh, about folks who might be living in the earlier stages of the diagnosis where they really can together with the person living with dementia can make some decisions around their care. It really does mirror a partnership and trying to decide what are some of the aspects of the future that we want to think about now, whether it's think legal issues and paperwork and things that we want to get in order, preferences um, that we want to talk through, but it can mirror more of a partnership. I think as the disease progresses, it oftentimes can turn maybe a little more into what folks might think of traditionally as caregiving, where um, the individual is providing um, hands-on support, you're bearing not only the weight of the physical tasks, the day-to-day -day tasks, the household tasks that need to be managed, the emotional um, responsibilities as well, helping folks process through what they're thinking and feeling. Um, so caregivers often have um, just really big roles where they're handling every aspect of the care from the personal to the household to the appointments. Um, we ask a lot of caregivers. 
we do ask a lot for caregivers of caregivers. Yeah. Um, I often say caregiving is um, not a sprint; it's a marathon. Mm. And um, the most successful caregivers are ones who, you know, seek out support, who take care of themselves. And so, um, we're going to talk a little bit about that as well in future episodes. But um, so, when we talk about caregiving, a lot of times spouse become the first line of defense in caregiving, mm-hmm. or they take on that role first. Um, I know when I started in this field 10 years ago, most of the caregivers were spouse or spousal caregivers, and then I've slowly, slowly seen some changes. Um, but as far as, as far as someone who's transitioning into this role um, as a spousal caregiver, what should they be thinking about? Yeah. Well, the first thing I think about is just the acknowledgement of the change in roles and relationships. So if you are a spouse or a partner to someone who's living with changes in dementia or memory and thinking, then in some ways it may feel like you have lost your partner and that they are no longer able to um, contribute in the same way that they previously were, even in decision making and deciding how we manage our finances. And, um, you know, whether we do this or do that, you may be grieving that you've lost that partner's ability to contribute. Um, and so I think that's important to note that there that's a that's a difference and specifically to spouses versus other folks who may serve in the caregiving role. I also think that you mentioned, um, you know, getting support. So connecting with others who can help you think through what, you know, what is going to be required of you, acknowledging what you're experiencing, what are the changes that you're seeing at home versus feeling like you live in a silo and no one is around you. It can feel very lonely and isolating. Um, So I would, I would definitely recommend connecting with someone uh, just so you can share stories and get feedback, get advice. And then I always, um, you know, I think about my first line of defense is just evaluating if you have all of the paper, the legal forms in order. Do you have power of attorney, health care and, um, and financial? Do you have all of those I's dotted and T's crossed? Especially if it's a new diagnosis and you're earlier in the stages, it can be something that you want to make sure you have locked down. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Often find too that spouse spouses tend to be very protective. Mm. Right? So they'll carry a lot of that burden and not really share it. Um, and then sometimes something will happen. They'll end up in the hospital, and the family's really kind of caught off guard that mm. that their um, parent is actually experiencing a disease or is a lot farther along than what they realize. Do you see that quite often as well? Yeah, and spouses, I would totally agree because as a partnership or as a a, a couple, you have determined kind of how you interact with one another. We, you know, I have a colleague who calls it your kabuki dance. Like you figured out like how we dance together and now that's all up in question. And so you all have your rhythm at home that you've established. And the last thing that a lot of folks want is a third party coming in to disrupt that. Or some may take it personally that it that it looks like I can't care for my partner or my spouse and that I need a third person. And, and I would just say that, again, caregiving is a 24-7, 365 day a year role that you're playing. And it's it's reasonable that you would want to ask for help. But yeah, I do see that specifically with spouses, there's maybe a delay in getting another person at the table to help with that. Even sometimes privacy uh, with not inviting children into that, adult children. Um, it may be, you know, we'll manage our finances, we'll manage the in-home. And then it feels like there comes a point, whether if it's because of crisis or a drastic change where the, fl- the white flags go up and the spouse says, I can't do this anymore. And now we're in crisis mode. And so we have to kind of figure out, OK, what are we going to do? Is it bringing someone in? Are we looking at, you know, maybe a, a placement outside of the home? So, you know, one of the things that can be helpful to think about is just a contingency plan. You know, mm-hmm. right now I am providing care for my, my, my spouse or my partner, and I'm going to do that for as long as I can safely. If something were to happen, if life threw me a curveball, what would be my plan B? You know, what what is it an adult child who's willing to step in? Is it a, maybe a temporary or more permanent move to a residential care community? So just entertaining the idea of a contingency plan can be helpful. 
Yes, absolutely. And you bring up a good point about adult um, children. Often uh, they step in at times of crisis or they're called to step in at times of crisis. And for adult children, we see a lot of times that they're carrying a lot of other burdens besides, mm -hmm. um, or a lot of other roles as well, besides just caregiving. You know, they're also caring for um, their children or maybe their spouses um, or um, their in-laws as well. So, um, and I believe we call that the sandwich generation. Are yeah. you familiar with that? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And we've seen that a lot more um, where they're kind of sandwiched between caregiving their children and caregiving for their parents. And, you know, often with um, adult children, as they step in, there's that role reversal, that time for adjustment. Um, can you speak to a little bit about some of the issues that involve an adult child stepping in as a caregiver? Yeah, I think the first one you mentioned being, you know, within the sandwich generation, you know, you, you're you managing, like you said, your own children, potentially the needs of in-laws, the needs of your own parents, your own career, your own marriage, if that's, you know, or any other relationships, friendships that you have, you're juggling all of that at one time. And so I think one of the primary issues that we see with adult children is just a lack of margin. There's not a lot of extra time and space. Um, so that can certainly be difficult to figure out. Um, also, that delicate balance of when do I step in and how do I step in? Because, you know, you are the child and in some relationships, you may always feel like you're 15 or you're 13, even though, you know, you're 50 years old, it can still feel like you're that teenager. And so a lot of folks, you know, want to show respect to their parent. And, you know, what I would enchant, what I encourage, you know, adult children to think about is that, you know, if there are changes in the brain that are happening, right, your brain is changing, your brain is sort of deceiving someone as to what they can safely do, that it's, it is an act of love to, it is an act of love to the family member to be able to step in and provide boundaries. <laughs> Um, so um, that's what I would think about for adult children is just realizing that you may put your foot in the door. It may be kind of inch by inch a little bit at a time, but it is a way to show care for your parent by stepping in. And we can work through some of the nuances of that and talking about when do you do that? So a good a way to measure that that I tell folks is there's this delicate balance between independence, right, and safety. So when safety is an issue, we have to step in when it's preference. Like, um, you know, my mom is going to the grocery store and she, her clothes aren't matching. And that's never, that's not how my mom would have dressed. You know, that's not her style. She was always really put together and now she's going out in public and it doesn't feel like it's reflective of her. But when I invite mom to change her clothes, it creates an argument or an issue. You know, we kind of look at that and say, let's, is it worth it? Like, is it worth it to engage and create some agitation and anxiety? Or is that an area where we can just roll with it? You know, because safety isn't an issue, but it's more about preference. So helping folks, you know, adult children think through those differences. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and again, you know, often, unfortunately, often mm -hmm. caregiving starts during a moment of crisis. And so it's better to kind of start those conversations, as you said, beforehand, and they can be really small conversations. And um, just to kind of see also to gauge where your parent is and what their thoughts are about their future care, um, about the care of their spouse and when they think they might need some help. Often yeah. call it line in the sand, right? Like, yep. so <laughs> whenever I deal with caregivers, like, where is your line in the sand? Where are you going to say, well, when I start having to do X, Y, and Z, we're going to have to talk about something. And the good thing about saying is that it shifts and it moves. So right. um, a lot of times you can get up to that point and go, well, that wasn't so bad. So yeah. um, I think it's the same thing with adult children. Sometimes things you just um, kind of easily ease your way into it. And before you know, you're the primary caregiver yeah. in that situation. So um, yeah. do you have some, you mentioned um, just kind of, you know, trying to pick your battles, but what other tips um, for success do you have for adult children who are becoming caregivers? 
Yeah, I think, and this may be true also for spouses and partners, but the idea of as, as the disease progresses, you you will need support. And what does that mean? What does that look like? Well, I think I often think about it as you are, you are the head or the chair of this board or this group. So you're the one that's ultimately as the primary caregiver calling the shots, but you will need other people sitting around that table with you that can contribute. And there will be seasons where people roll off the board and seasons where people need to roll in. It's not that once they're around the table, they will forever be around the table. But the thought that you will manage this alone and do this alone um, it's just, it's not very kind to yourself because you will need care and support. So what does that mean? I'm not just saying about, you know, hiring aides and companions and, you know, adult day programs, which are all wonderful and can be very helpful, but it might be, there might be a season where one of the people at your, your board table, if you will, is a speech therapist or an occupational therapist or physical therapist. So it might be your siblings. Um, you know, oftentimes when there are siblings, typically someone is highlighted as the it person for that could be for a variety of reasons. So someone's going to be the leader. But what are your siblings? What are they able to contribute if they are local, if they're long distance? Maybe they have access to some financial resources. Maybe they're really good researchers and they can look into um, local resources and, you know, potential solutions to some of the challenges that you're encountering. So what at the, the so other siblings at the table, what do they want to do? How are they able to contribute? So what can we ask of them? You know, I think about other people in your community. So if your parent was really linked to their faith-based community, for example, their faith community, what could they do for you? For example, you know, I know with COVID things got a little complicated, but, you know, I had a family where the, the mom loved going to church. It was her, I mean, she really looked forward to it on Sunday. Driving became an issue. So the children actually had someone from the church that was willing to come pick mom up, take her to church, bring her home. And that was a way that mom's needs were met. The kids kind of got a morning off, if you will. The adult children had a, a morning off, but it was a way to, to still invest in mom and someone from the community was able to contribute. There will come a time where that's no longer able to happen, right? So that person might roll off the board. So just that would be my advice is to think about who do I need around the table for, for now, for this season, for where we are? Absolutely. And, you know, also something that people don't talk about with adult children is work. Like, as you mentioned, a lot of them yeah. have careers of their own um, and they may not be familiar with certain um, ways to take off time, FMLA and those mm -hmm. sort of things. And we don't have to get really into that nitty gritty stuff. But um, is it important for a caregiver to inform or why is it? I think it's important, but do you agree that it's important to, if you're a caregiver, inform your, um, at least your HR department that you're going through um, this new responsibility and, you know. Yeah, I, I do. I, I think my gut is reaction is yes. It's definitely helpful to be transparent if that's with your direct report or your direct supervisor or the human resources team. You know, this is kind of what's going on in my personal life. At the same time, I do acknowledge that there are some work environments where that's not, that doesn't feel safe to say that. It doesn't feel like I can be honest and genuine about that. So what in those cases, you know, I've encouraged folks, well, if you don't feel like you can tell your HR or your supervisor because of work dynamics, can you tell a colleague just so that when you are in your work environment, someone knows that you are carrying a lot in your personal life and that you may feel pulled in a lot of directions, even though that colleague doesn't have authority or power to say, you know, just take the rest of the day off. But just to know that you have some type of support at work, I think could be helpful. But yes, because um, there are varieties with FMLA, you know, we aren't the experts, but you don't have to take a number of consecutive days or weeks, like you can do a kind of a short term or interim FMLA. So there are some options um, there that could afford you some flexibility that will be important when providing care. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And then as I was speaking about earlier, the recipe for success, I think for, especially for adult children, because they're caring so much, is to take care of themselves, mm -hmm. right? To really kind of prioritize that. And it's, it's, 
I know it's a lot easier said than done. And when I found myself as a primary caregiver for a couple of years, um, I really had to kind of, when I found myself finding myself saying, no one else can take care of them the way that I can. It's the moment that I need to step back (laughs) because like I was way too invested in time. And, um, you know, as long as they're safe and clean and then they're, they're able to provide the same care. So, um, yeah, so go ahead. Well, I was, I would say I agree with that. And I hear that from spouses, from adult children, because there's this idea, which is not untrue, right? That, you know, this hired companion aid agency, they're, they don't love my mom or my dad or my husband the way that, that I do. And that's true. But I would also kind of argue to that they also get to clock in and clock out, whereas you're doing it all the time. So they get a four hour shift or an eight hour shift. And so there's a different um, margin available to you when you're clocking in and clocking out. But when you're doing it round the clock all the time, uh, you wear thin and you may feel recharged and refreshed after a couple hours of being able to step back and then step back into it. So, yeah, it is hard. It's hard to give up that control. It is. It is, especially when it's somebody that you care for. So exactly. Much. Yes. So you mentioned earlier about long distance caregivers. Mm-hmm. I think that they um, a lot of times are dismissed, but also take an easy way out. <laughs> I always call my long distance. I call them out on that. And because um, there's a lot of things that they can do. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, they can look at finances, they can manage finances. You know, anytime you involve money in family, it always gets a little dicey. Um, and so, you know, if that's just one less thing you have to worry about, then that's great. Um, what are some other things that long distance caregivers can do from afar and still feel really engaged and as a support system for that primary caregiver? Yeah. Well, I think one is um, staying connected to the care recipient too. So, you know, if, if that is calling, you know, I've seen where siblings have a schedule, like you call mom on Monday, you video chat mom on Thursday, and then the, the, whoever the local primary caregiver maybe even isn't on that rotation um, formally, but knows that long distance care partners, whether that's siblings or cousins or whomever that is, is going to be checking in. So one, you can help by helping the care recipient have the opportunity to be engaged, giving them someone to talk to. Definitely, um, if you can assist with the financial piece and reconciling bank statements, and boy, that takes a lot of energy that a lot of care partners um, may not have. Research. So if we're noticing, for example, that maybe it's time to engage um, an agency, an adult day program, a third party to come in the home, that that's a big job to screen um, potential agencies or individuals or to call and get the do you have openings do you not you know all of those things so from afar you can absolutely um you can take the lead on that you know for your primary caregiver you know you could call our team your community too and then we can give you some suggestions of where to start and then the person from a distance can do a lot of the filtering and the screening, which is really helpful. It saves the, the local primary caregiver from spending a lot of time on the phone and bearing no fruit, like we're mm-hmm. not making progress. So those are definitely ways that I think folks can just being able to research. And then if possible, it's not always possible, regularly scheduled respite visits and regularly might mean once a month, once a quarter, twice a year, you know, it doesn't mean every week, you know, but knowing that, you know, your sibling from out of state is going to come in two times a year and is able to offer you six days of, of respite. A lot of times knowing that that's coming, knowing that the primary caregiver doesn't have to ask for it, but that you're going to do it can be really helpful when that's possible and acknowledging it's not always possible. But that's something just to be mindful of um, that a long distance caregiver can do. And it would be really meaningful. Yes, absolutely. Quite often when I was working at the adult day program, 
most of the time the referral came from somebody from out of town, right, who had come home to visit and then realized that the caregiver was really kind of drowning in responsibility and needed a break and then would get online and go, hey, um, I'll look at this up and see if there's some other resources or support for you. So um, I think there's a lot of value in a long distance caregiver um, that, you know, that they can really um, participate, be an active participant in caregiving and still being far away. So, yeah. You know, one other, sorry, Ashley, one other thing that kind of comes to my mind, I don't know, I'm sure you may see elements of this too, of, you know, if I'm the local primary caregiver, it feels like a big job to have to keep everybody else informed as to what's happening here. So we go to the doctor's office and I have to, call for brothers and sisters or, you know, I have to be the re- the relayer of information. And I think figuring out a system that works for your family unit, again, because it's not always just uh, siblings, it might be aunts and uncles, nieces, you know, all of the, the family line. So what is going to be the best and easiest way for you to communicate? Is it picking a point person? Like you call me after the appointment and I'll make sure everybody knows what's going on. Or is it a group text? Is it a Google doc of sorts? So just identifying and acknowledging you're doing a lot as the local primary caregiver. Can I, cause this one way that it would be helpful for you to not have to tell the same story 10 times. So Absolutely. Absolutely. And we have great technology nowadays that enables people to stay informed and communicate with each other and very easy. Yeah. Um, So uh, one last thing I want to ask you before we wrap up is if someone is new to caregiving, where should they start? Hmm. That's a great question. Um, Well, I would say certainly at your, you have a couple of options. So knowing that, so if your family member Um, was recently diagnosed, or maybe you're noticing that things are progressing a bit, you do have options. So you can always start typically within your clinic, whether it was a neurology clinic or a primary care doc who made the initial diagnosis. There are sometimes social workers in those clinics who can be helpful in just keeping you aware of what's local. I would say contact your county area agency on aging. Um, You can certainly reach out to my team. And the beautiful thing is that you don't have to know why you're calling. Maybe when they say, you know, I often will say, well, what led you to call us today? You may say, I'm caregiving and I don't have a clue where to go from here. And I think our job, my job, Ashley's job is to is to take this huge elephant. We've all talked about, I think there's an elephant behind me, but you can take this huge elephant and just bring it in, bring the focus in and say, okay, today we're going to start here. You know, so I I think about a caller I had who, um, you know, there was a new diagnosis very early in the process, but the caller was understandably so overwhelmed that we were already wanted to already talk about end of life and funeral planning and things like that that are important, but they're not important today. Like today, let's talk about you, there's a diagnosis. What does that mean for right now? And then we can kind of broaden the picture a bit. So I would say your your local agencies, our agency, and even your doctor's office, if there's a social worker on staff there. Would you would you add anyone else to that, Ashley? No, actually, I would say um, mention the social worker at the doctor's office. I'm finding that's um, a new role that doctors are exploring, and they've become a great wealth of information as well as partners for agencies like ours in the county. But no, I yeah. can agree with that. Absolutely. So you mentioned um, your agency. So if somebody wanted to reach out to you, what would be the best way to contact you? Sure. Um, so you do not need a referral from a provider. So you can make the call yourself. Um, you can call our main line if you'd like. Um, and that number is 919- six six zero seven five one zero and again we're a small team so um, it will not be hard to find us um, you could also our website is dukefamilysupport.org um, that has all of our our staff listed as well as emails if you prefer emailing I know sometimes it's hard to find a moment to talk um, so you can just reach out there's no cost for um, our any of the services that we mentioned today from your service to the social worker there's no cost for that. So you can certainly reach out um, as many times as you need. So you can just call us or email us. And then we usually schedule a time to talk knowing that 
you know, schedules can be funny and we want to find a time where you do have some time to share a little bit about what's going on. Wonderful. And even though y'all are in Durham or Raleigh, um, Durham, okay, um, you still manage to make it out to the different parts of the states. We do. So, yes, so various times. So, um, you know, you can talk face to face if that's what you prefer, but you can also talk over the phone. So, yeah, I guess I'm remiss I didn't mention Project Care, but Project Care is another piece of what we do, which is more respite focused. Um, mm -hmm. So, we do that, that kind of modified care management, which you're, we're already doing and you're already doing. And in addition to that, we have some funds for respite um, as well. Yes, and I look forward to talking more about that in future yeah. episodes. So, but thank you so much, Natalie. I really appreciate it. Um, and that's all the time we have for today. We want to thank everyone for watching and hope that you find the information beneficial and valuable. For more information on the programs and services at ADTS, you can visit our website, which is www.adtsrc.org, or you can give us a call at 336-349-2343. Um, again, thank you for joining us today. Remember that ADTS is here to help you and your family age with dignity and independence and to remain in your home and in your community. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to At Home with ADTS. For over 45 years, Aging, Disability and Transit Services of Rockingham County has focused on enhancing quality of life for individuals by empowering them to achieve optimum health and well-being, independence and participation in community. To learn more about community-based services, resources, or how to help, visit ADTSRC.org or call 336-349-2343.